ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This is Nicola Graziani speaking. I'm AGI News Agency uh, diplomatic correspondent from Rome. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you to NATO Defense College, NATO Foundation for this excellent opportunity. They're giving us to uh, make up our minds about what's going on when the day after this pandemic is over. The pandemic is, will not last forever, last forever, and we have to understand the new situation, new balances which are reshaped in the Mediterranean world by, uh, by the new uh, supplies of energy, by the new balances of powers, and by a new form of market, which is going to be uh, organized uh, by the new situ situation. Um, we have to uh, say thank you, first of all, to our guests here. Uh, I'm referring to Marco Pereda. He's here. He's a friend. He's the head of the political scenarios and institutional support for business development for any in Rome. Uh, Professor Odette Eran is a senior research fellow of Institute of, for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, Mr. Marco Zawa here uh, is, works for the NATO Defense College in Rome. And last but not least, of course, Davide Sempio is Senior Stakeholders Relations Coordinator for the Trans Adriatic Pipeline AG in Lecce. I'll, I'll be very, sure, very, very short because, I mean, time is running out already. Uh, just let me uh, remind you that uh, new balances, new uh, challenges, uh, and new threats to traditional and uh, traditional energy uh, infrastructure. How the uh, economic operator can help build a new order in the, such an area, I mean the Mediterranean area, which is famed for being pretty troublesome. So uh, first of all, please, Marco, say something about what to do in the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you to the NATO uh, Defense College for inviting me and for organizing this, uh, this event. Uh, um, I would uh, start from the present, if you, if you don't mind, sure, go ahead. before uh, uh, saying something about the future, because we need to, remind, uh, to remember that uh, the uh, secu security of supplies, the energy security of supplies, is, uh, is not a strategic concern for, for Europe. Mm -hmm. in, in the relations between uh, the two sides of the Mediterranean, we can rely on safe uh, sources, on safe uh, and diversified uh, routes for, for the supplies, at least for conventional sources, as, sure. as we rely on uh, uh, mostly uh, at present. And this, uh, this is not by chance. It, is, uh, it is about, was about uh, long decades of investments, uh, uh, complex systems, uh, and uh, first of all, the fact that uh, um, the security of supply uh, was and is a strategic priority for Europe. Um, we have, as you can see from, from this map uh, for gas, we have so many uh, suppliers and different routes that uh, uh, we can uh, encounter some uh, temporary uh, uh, limits, but uh, there, is no, there is no concern about uh, the supplies of gas or even, even less for oil for Europe. How is it changing the security of supply in these uh, time of energy transition. First of all, the energy transition will, is something that will uh, last long, but uh, the, in this uh, make or break uh, time and decade, we need to move fast in this, in this transformation, and this will, of course, affect also the way we think and rethink uh, the security of supply. Uh, let me first uh, say that we are already seeing some transformation in the area, again mm -hmm. uh, referring to the relations between uh, Europe and the Med. Uh, we are already seeing, uh, for example, the producing countries uh, increasing their demand, so uh, in the future the production that traditionally was uh, uh, for the consumption of the Europeans will be more and more production of gas mainly, 
will be more and more in the future uh, for the consumption of the uh, developing uh, southern Mediterranean countries. And this is one important uh, factor that will shift powers and uh, change the way we see uh, that, for example, the development of infrastructures. We will need, uh, we will need very, very uh, probably not more pipelines for gas. Uh, we will need maybe we will need in case and after a, a huge transformation uh, more power lines connecting the two areas. Um, uh, a final remark that I would, uh, I would make, uh, I would like to make uh, referring to the future uh, is about uh, what kind of energy landscape we, will, uh, uh, we, we should expect. Um, there is a spreading nar narrative that saying that uh, with the growing role of renewables we will have uh, uh, access to, uh, an easy access to renewables uh, everybody in, in his country. So we, have, uh, we will have uh, prosumer countries which uh, produce and consume their own energy. We will have uh, prosumer households. Everybody will have uh, its own energy to produce and to consume. Well, this is a, a, a kind of picture that, uh, uh, on, on which I am a little bit wary, I would say, mm -hmm. because I, I still believe that the specialization of systems and uh, uh, competition between systems uh, will be more efficient and will have a role in the future. So I would s see not a fragmented, uh, fra fragmented and uh, divided uh, uh, world with everybody on his own, uh, autonomous, autar autarchic. I would uh, see a, a system where interdependence uh, will be very different but uh, will still be there. And uh, now the question is, uh, what kind of interdependence uh, we will be obliged to manage to deal with? For example, as I was saying before, there will be more uh, uh, power lines and less pipelines. So one, one, one issue for energy security will be definitely cyber security, the security of uh, very complex power lines. Another issue will be the competition for rare materials, uh, which are localized geographically. Not everybody uh, has uh, lithium or other uh, materials that are needed for uh, renewable production and storage, which is another uh, very important solution that uh, we need to build on. I so would uh, you, you, stop you, here. You mean that I won't have my you know, a homemade energy in the future. You know what I mean? I mean, no, make your yourself, uh, make your own uh, generator in your home. This will be part of the solution, okay. part I of see. the future, mm -hmm. but we cannot uh, imagine a, a future of every single person or city producing and uh, uh, consuming the same, uh, its own energy. Okay, I'm pretty disappointed with it, but anyway, now we are going to see a video before giving the floor to Mr. Iran. Please, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, let me spend two minutes on the current situation and then move to the future. Uh, first of all, it was good that we see this, uh, we saw this video because on the map that was presented in the first five minutes, the uh, Eastern Middle East and Mediterranean doesn't appear on the map. And we have already two medium-sized uh, producer and potential exporters, uh, Egypt and then Israel. Uh, while the situation in the Western Mediterranean is secure, safe, uh, as it was described uh, in the first presentation, 
The Eastern Mediterranean is a bit more complex. We have problems between Turkey on the one hand and almost all the other East Mediterraneans, mostly Greece, uh, Cyprus, of course, and even with Israel and Egypt. Then we have the unsettled dispute with uh, between Israel and Lebanon, and then uh, the question of what will the Palestinians do with the little but very important for them quantity of uh, natural gas. Uh, basically, Israel and Egypt are already producing years, uh, for at least uh, 10 years, producing uh, uh, LNG. And uh, others who have, as I said, Lebanon mostly, Cyprus and the Palestinians are yet years to come before they begin to exploit their uh, natural gas. Uh, and this is something that is reflected on their economies. If you look at the situation of the Lebanese economy, partly it is where it is because they are not even beginning to exploit their natural uh, resources, mostly the natural gas. Uh, and this is very uh, important and essential that they begin to do this because, and this is where I come to the future, we are all the owners of natural gas are in a race of time. Assuming that the Green Deal, the European uh, very ambitious plan to come to green energy and assuming that the climate international agenda kicks in, we have mostly 20 years before we move to green energy. And this is a very important and very crucial for the economies of the Eastern uh, countries, Eastern Mediterranean uh, countries. We have an interim period where we will have what is called blue hydrogen, blue energy, which is still moving towards renewables, but based on current fossil energy resources. And then we move to green, totally green energy, where we don't use any of the traditional resources uh, of energy. And this is where I think the regional and the international effort, mostly of Europe, uh, is uh, stepping in or kicking in. First of all, I think that the regional producers, current producers, have to increase their cooperation. We have already the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum uh, created two, three years ago, but we need to move further to increase the cooperation together with some European countries, Italy, France, Greece, Cyprus, in order to transport whatever we can sell to Europe in this interim period of 10 to 15 years. We have to increase the cooperation between the states of the region, the Middle East, the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean countries, in beginning to move to green energy, mostly solar energy. I'm joking. If you have 365 days a year, 
Jordan, for example, has 400 days of sun. And therefore, the new cooperation should concentrate on, first of all, supplying the region itself with solar and other renewables, and then wind cooperation with Europe, selling solar energy to Europe, which doesn't have 400 days or not even 200 days of sun. And I think that this is where I want to end my initial presentation. It is very important that Europe becomes the umbrella for political cooperation be be between the various East Mediterranean countries and becomes also the economic umbrella, including assisting in creating the economic cooperation between these countries. I think that this is a message that I, I hope that Europe will read and translate into action uh, as the EU, not only as individual member states like Cyprus, Greece, or Italy. And this is where I would like to end. Thank you, Professor. Perfect timing, I see. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ozawa, is this going to be a win-win game for everybody or not in your view? Uh, well, uh, will it be a win-win game for everyone? I, I think that there will probably be uh, winners and losers. I see. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, to, to my colleague's point, there's going to be a more distributed and diversified uh, energy matrix, uh, and that will benefit some, uh, particularly startup, smaller companies, uh, those uh, working with new technology, uh, and the larger companies uh, will be uh, uh, encouraged to rethink their approach. So, well, as, as for the rest, I mean, for the general situation of the area, what do you think? What's your position on it? Uh, for the, the, well, for the, the general position of the area, um, I think that uh, I was thinking about um, uh, today's topic sort of in the, in the context of, of NATO's role uh, and uh, uh, what's, um, uh, how NATO can work not only with its members and also with partners in the region. Uh, and from this perspective, uh, I think that um, there's, uh, there's a role for NATO and it will be evolving. Uh, this has been, the, the uh, issue of energy security has been front and center uh, with uh, the Secretary General's uh, uh, 2030 initiative. Uh, in his press conference yesterday, uh, he highlighted energy security uh, as being part of the discussions with uh, the foreign ministers. Uh, and uh, we can expect that if there is a new strategic concept, uh, it will also uh, play a, a prominent role. I don't want to steal your time, but anyway, you may go ahead with your yeah, intervention. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, no, that, that's fine, that's <laughs> fine. It's, uh, it, I, I, I'm enjoying the discussion, listening to the, the speakers. It's getting me also to think about um, you know, not wanting to repeat. Yeah, some but of the I mean, that, we're, you're uh, giving, I'm giving you two minutes of extra time anyway. Okay, Don't all you right, worry. sure. <laughs> um, well, just to uh, very briefly, uh, I, I thought what might be helpful also for this, this discussion uh, is to talk about what NATO is and what it is not in mm -hmm. terms of energy security and, and what role it can play to mm -hmm. contribute to uh, energy security in the region. Um, NATO deals with energy security in, in sort of a, a very limited scope. Uh, the first is through situational awareness, uh, basically information sharing among the members uh, and the partners. Uh, the second way that it deals with energy security is of course with the protection of its own uh, facilities uh, and infrastructure. Uh, a lot of people may not, don't, don't know this, but uh, NATO actually owns and runs its own pipeline system, the Central European pipeline system. Um, 
The third way that NATO deals with uh, energy security uh, historically is through energy efficiency measures. Uh, and I think that uh, energy efficiency, uh, greening NATO is going to become uh, a stronger emphasis in the future. Uh, this has certainly been a part of the, uh, the NATO 2030 uh, initiative. Uh, and it also uh, marks a, uh, uh, a departure from how NATO has historically approached energy security. Uh, his, not going into too much detail, um, energy security really became um, uh, part of NATO's mandate and activities uh, in the late 2000s uh, due to geopolitical events. Uh, won't go into too much detail, but there was concern about from some member states about uh, particular suppliers uh, and you know uh, one supplier in particular um, which became another concern in 2014 uh, with the, the Ukraine uh, crisis and the uh, the annexation of Crimea all of this helped to solidify uh, an approach uh, within the alliance towards energy security along these three lines in my view, and this is, you know, I should preface that these are my views and I'm not speaking mm -hmm. officially on behalf of mm -hmm. NATO, but sure. in my view, uh, it's, um, it's a helpful approach to energy security because it not only deals with the concerns of uh, many of the member states, it also um, uh, helps to limit the degree of political debates uh, and geopolitical concerns coming into uh, NATO fora. This has been historically uh, a challenge for NATO going back to the 1960s mm -hmm. when different member states have concerns about uh, energy security. In the past, it's been primarily about security of supply. Uh, interestingly enough, although uh, security of supply concerns maybe may have been focused more on Russia over the last decade, uh, it originally became a, a concern because of the um, uh, because of the, the oil price shock of 1973. And there was a concern uh, to diversify supply away from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And some NATO member states uh, looked to both Norway and the Soviet Union at that time. Yeah. And so th there's been, uh, uh, at times, a tension within the alliance about security of supply. Uh, but for the last decade, uh, it has been pretty consistent focusing on these three areas. I would say that um, NATO is also a part of its environment. And uh, what the other speakers, what my colleagues here have, uh, have mentioned about this sort of energy transition process, uh, the, 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 the greening uh, of NATO and acknowledgement of concerns about climate security, uh, these are becoming more relevant uh, and important for NATO. Uh, they were also uh, part of the uh, recent reflection groups, uh, final report, and uh, the Secretary uh, General also uh, commissioned a, a young leaders uh, group to analyze issues like energy security uh, as part of the, the NATO 2030 process. So all of this is to say that NATO is a part of its environment uh, and because uh, because there is a, an energy transition taking place right now, NATO is, uh, is definitely uh, um, subject to that and is taking it seriously. Uh, I think that security of supply will uh, continue to be important for NATO, um, but uh, uh, diversification of supply will be, become more important, uh, as will addressing, issue, uh, addressing issues of carbon emissions, um, and to this uh, extent, NATO has partners in the region uh, that, uh, that are uh, mentioned on the screen here, some of which are energy suppliers uh, to Europe already. Uh, others will become uh, stronger suppliers uh, uh, to Europe. And uh, given NATO's uh, partnership relations uh, with these countries, um, there's certainly a lot to be done in terms of situational awareness. Uh, and capacity building. So I'll, I, I'm not sure if I've gone over time now. No, no, but, no, no, no. Uh, You're still uh, more than one minute left. Okay. Yeah, go All ahead. Right. 
Well, I, I think I, I, I've said about everything that I, I wanted to say at this point, and uh, I'll, I'll look forward to the, the okay. questions and answers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you thank so you. much. Uh, now, it's David De Sempius Shift. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, good. Thank you very much. And, uh, good evening, everybody. Many thanks for your invitation today um, uh, I will try to quick because I'm uh, willing to discuss uh, um, potential questions from the, from the audience so it's very, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today uh, and to talk about tap and this uh, this panel uh, is already bringing to the overall security of supply of the continent and uh, area uh, I think most of you are aware uh, of uh, the TAP and the Southern Gas Corridor fine uh, are bringing uh, uh, net Europe from a new source and uh, and the route. Very good news for the uh, security of supply of the continent, but also diversification and for competing gas sources. Uh, uh, flowing through the pipelines, uh, feeding uh, um, Italy and ultimately the EU. So, a uh, total of 1 billion kilometers we have been seeing uh, last week, uh, uh, the, uh, the first EM to tap uh, and in uh, Europe on, uh, on the Greece border. Uh, this, uh, this symbolic amount corresponds more or less uh, 1 million and 300,000 households. And uh, uh, for sure, this is good news because, uh, uh, as I was appreciating also during the, the previous interventions, uh, uh, if we are able to further diversify and strengthen the, the security of the um, is a good point. And uh, uh, I also agree with you with most of the cooperation between the countries is key to ensure more stable energy deliveries and, uh, and uh, eventually cope with, um, with the challenges that the whole industry is uh, facing uh, in uh, in the present and of course in the near future. Um, uh, when it comes to pipelines, of course, uh, the book from Parakan Cryptography comes to my mind. I don't know if you have a, uh, ever read a very interesting book. Parag would argue that uh, the new global is no longer based on geographies, but rather on interconnections, this means uh, highways, pipelines, and, and internet cables. So um, he was uh, he was uh, 250 and, uh, kilometers of a border between countries uh, where uh, in the world we have 64 uh, high uh, kilometers of highways, millions more of uh, of and gas pipelines uh, and, and then railways and then uh, also uh, under the sea internet cables. So um, when it comes to geopolitics, of, of course, and uh, uh, security of supply, uh, um, TAP, like TAP can play in fostering the competitiveness and, and uh, ultimately Um If we could go to the next slide, maybe uh, I could show via uh, that I have tried to to uh, to depict uh, how TAP can contribute to the overall energy security, uh, um, already have appreciated. Uh, we have making we have made the market still more stable as uh, we and the uh, uh, or a sudden supply one. Uh, to in his previous uh, speech uh, um, would be partially compensated by this new route and this new source. So of course, TAP is not what it's a new route because uh, it further uh, helps uh, Italy and Europe, which are heavily dependent on external suppliers uh, to further diversify uh, their connections to this, uh, to this supply source. And uh, the key contribution of TAP has been underlined also by um, the recent report uh, of the uh, Security Department of Italy's uh, presidency of the Council. So 
um, in the broader uh, picture of uh, Europe, the Mediterranean, and I would argue also the southeastern area of Europe, uh, TAP uh, uh, can uh, can play a significant role. Um, of course, when we talk about security, I think we also uh, speak about uh, the cost of energy because uh, a more interconnected market also allows for uh, the leveling of the different prices of energy. Um, uh, historically, um, Italy uh, is paying a spread of roughly two euros per megawatt hour with respect to the Dutch hub, the, the so-called TTF. And uh, uh, through the connection via TAP, maybe it has been, um, how can I say, uh, a coincidence, but uh, I'd rather uh, rule out this opportunity and say that uh, um, we are assisting to uh, progressive reduction of the spread between the TTF and the PSV. And uh, this difference, of course, uh, decreased to, to zero uh, in, uh, in mid-January and in some cases even went in the opposite direction. So. Uh, we were able, as a country, as Italy, to uh, first export gas uh, uh, during uh, um, the first weeks of the year towards Northern Europe. And this is, uh, the speed volumes are quite symbolic. Uh, the trend is now, is now the one uh, that I mentioned before. So um, this effect, I, I, I think that also allows uh, Europe and the Mediterranean to meet uh, their increasing energy needs, also in terms, of course, of uh, uh, future um, ways uh, of, uh, of energy supply, not only fossil fuels like gas, unfortunately, is, but also in terms of uh, uh, um, renewables and especially uh, the future we see is, uh, is, uh, is hydrogen, actually. Um, before going to, uh, to briefly describe uh, what the commitment of the natural gas industry is towards hydrogen especially, I would, strength, um, I would uh, uh, underline the contribution that TAP is uh, uh, providing to the further decarbonization and uh, diversification of supply of southeastern Europe, and namely Greece, Bulgaria and the Balkans, as you can see. Uh, Volumes uh, uh, flowing through TAP can supply between the 20% and the 30% of the yearly gas demand of Greece and Bulgaria, respectively. So, uh, once again, when it comes to uh, the broader picture of security of supply and diversification, uh, pipelines uh, like TAP can, uh, can actually uh, uh, be very helpful to uh, level the playing field between, uh, between the different countries. And, of course, last but not least, uh, uh, decarbonization, of course, uh, a less decarbonized economy to me can be achieved also via, uh, uh, as Marco uh, already was highlighting, via uh, the, the current uh, uh, sustainable fuels like uh, gas, I think, I think is, of course, uh, um, we are called to retrofit the existing infrastructure. Uh, existing gas pipeline are not uh, stranded assets uh, and can uh, welcome and accommodate potential uh, blends of hydrogen and, and natural gas. And uh, of course, the oil and gas industry has to face this challenge and uh, 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 survive at the end. Uh, but uh, in the race to achieve a low carbon future, uh, uh, gas and the overall uh, fossil fuel industry uh, uh, is well positioned to, to, to have a say and to contribute to the uh, uh, overall security of supply in a greener environment. Uh, we have recently signed a letter, uh, an open letter, alongside with other uh, 100 companies uh, active in the European energy scenario to uh, the EU Commission, um, uh, sorry, uh, Executive Vice President Mark Timmermans to facilitate uh, the discussion between uh, these operators. So uh, I guess uh, uh, I see Nicola is, is telling me that uh, I'm run over time. So I will stop now and leave the floor to, to your question. Sorry for Well, that. give him one more minute, one extra minute. So uh, now some questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the first is for Marco Pereda, of course. Uh, we mentioned the win-win win game. Who are going to be the winners and the losers of this big game? In the med. In the med. Yeah, or whatever you want. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, 
we, should, we shall distinguish between the, the mid and long term. Uh, as I was saying, in the mid term we will uh, rely, still rely heavily also in, on conventional sources, uh, oil and gas, and uh, uh, the producing countries will, uh, will still have uh, uh, the possibility to produce, export and get revenues. Uh, nevertheless, the producing countries, are, mm, especially uh, those uh, around the MED, are at risk if they not, don't manage, starting from today, uh, to diversify the, their economies. This is the, the biggest challenge. And also to make more efficient the use of the huge resources they have because there is also a matter of uh, energy efficiency, management of uh, uh, incentives uh, uh, which are not uh, um, supporting the right allocation of, uh, of resources. Um, so, um, I mean, um, the, um, the majority of analysts uh, uh, consider that among the producing countries, uh, the, the better off uh, will be those that will have already or will manage very fast to change their economies, uh, combine uh, new and, uh, and old resources, transform, uh, uh, for example, the, the, produce, uh, the, the, the production of gas in production of blue, blue hydrogen, for example, and also, uh, apart from the, the energy uh, sector, add uh, a, a, a more uh, diversified economy. On the, on the co consumer side, let's say, on the importer side, uh, the challenge is to, to manage to uh, implement a very fast uh, transformation without putting at risk the social and economic sustainability of this, uh, of this transformation. Um, Anyway, uh, I think that uh, all European countries and the European Union as a whole is uh, very well positioned in, term of, in terms of, uh, let's say, the race of, to the transition. It's only for the leadership in terms of, uh, um, of uh, energy policies, energy regulation, but because, uh, uh, for example, on hydrogen, uh, we can rely on uh, a, a, an important level I would say a first class level of technology and industry. Uh, on the uh, renewable side, uh, we, we are all, uh, I would say, suffering some the primacy of, uh, of China in terms of uh, uh, products, uh, value chain, not only in the uh, photovoltaic industry, but also we learned in the, in the, in the wind. Uh, sector, nevertheless, uh, uh, I mean, the race is, uh, is still, still open. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Mr. Iran, uh, you're there, I see. Uh, my uh, big question is about new forms of terrorism. Is a new form of terrorism emerging from these new challenges? Uh, how to deal with it? Uh, for the time being, we saw at least in the East Mediterranean, don't know enough about the Western side. There was one clear case where uh, energy networks were affected by terrorism, and this is in the Sinai Peninsula, which is part of Egypt, where the uh, Muslim brothers, apparently, or supporters of ISIS in Egypt, uh, blew, uh, blew up the pipeline supplying gas uh, to Jordan and to Israel. Uh, about, I would say, at least 20 times uh, to the extent that this supply has stopped. But this is uh, the only example that I can, uh, it's serious enough, but this is the only example. However, I want to make a point regarding your question because, uh, for example, if we talk about supply of LNG uh, or, or gas by pipelines to Europe, this is difficult to uh, be uh, damaged by terrorists because it's mostly under sea, uh, underwater uh, at the Mediterranean. However, when we talk about electricity, connection, some of it will be above ground 
Uh, and this is something which ought to be given uh, consideration. I don't think it's, uh, for the time being, I don't see that this is a factor in the overall picture of the transition uh, from the current uh, system of uh, 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 um, producing energy. I don't think that this is a major uh, issue and uh, except the, the, as I said, except the example which I already mentioned, I, I doubt that the, uh, the, as far as I know, the, the various potential terrorist organizations uh, are looking into this issue. For example, we have in the East Mediterranean, gas producers such as Israel and Egypt, the installations, which are functioning for more than a decade, as I said, uh, no attempt was made. Although, for example, Hezbollah has uh, rockets and missiles, which are certainly capable, uh, certainly with the addition of GPS uh, mechanisms to the existing arsenal, there was no attempt. And so uh, for political and for, for other reasons. I think for the time being, we are sort of uh, fine with the current situation. Whether in the future, terrorist organizations, either in the Middle East or in Europe, may resort to that, this is a possibility no signs yet for this happening. Thank you. So, Mr. Zawa, um, you mentioned uh, uh, the Ukraine crisis, the oil shock, uh, which forced some European, Western European countries to uh, look in a, in a very interested eye to the Soviet Union. What do you think can Russia do today in this new scenario? Well, um, I, I think that uh, with still most of the uh, uh, NATO member states, there's uh, concern about uh, concern about Russia and its actions mm -hmm. that um, uh, that have spilled over into discussions of energy security. Uh, and security of supply. Um, some NATO member states, particularly in Western Europe, have had very different experiences with Russia uh, than the Eastern European uh, member states. And I'm, I'm not talking about just uh, in the, uh, the Cold War period. I'm talking about contentious uh, negotiations mm -hmm. over gas contracts yeah. uh, and uh, supply disruptions. Um, I think that uh, some projects in Russia's view, and again, this is my own view of what, 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 uh, sure. what some of the, the decision makers may think, um, projects like Nord Stream 2 or Turk Stream are, from their view, intended to address security of supply concerns for Europe, uh, especially if there are disputes with uh, Russia's neighbors, they can continue to uh, supply and fulfill their contracts, uh, uh, even if there's a supply disruption uh, again with Ukraine. That is a very one-sided, I think, approach mm -hmm. to uh, addressing the, the concern that many NATO member states have uh, over Russia. I think what Russia could do is uh, a more, uh, is maybe a two-sided approach, uh, one that addresses not only the uh, concern about being able to fulfill its contracts, but also addresses uh, some of the political concerns. Uh, and that would be, um, uh, that would be address, that would be toning down uh, some of the rhetoric um, maybe uh, 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 implementing what, what we call confidence-building measures 
uh, to incrementally build up confidence uh, and uh, change the, um, uh, begin to change some of the concerns of uh, particularly Eastern European uh, and uh, uh, member states in the Baltic region tend to be the most vocal uh, about concerns over Russia. But at the heart of the, the issue is Crimea. And I think that uh, here we are sort of at an impasse. I don't think that uh, Russian leadership will uh, uh, conceive of or, or be open to the idea of giving Crimea back. Uh, and there are a host of other uh, issues related to um, the Minsk agreement uh, that, uh, that, that have stalled uh, moving beyond uh, the, the crisis. So this is still at the, uh, the heart of the matter. And I don't see in the short term uh, that this is, is going to be resolved. However, uh, you can still uh, open up channels of dialogue. You can start to try and uh, diffuse uh, the tension uh, to allow for things to, uh, for more productive discussions to happen uh, a little bit further uh, down the line. So that's a pessimistic view. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a pessimistic one. Uh, Davide, can you hear me now? I mean, your connection yes. was on and off a little bit before, so uh, be, please be patient if you don't understand me. Uh, I will repeat eventually, uh, in this case, uh, my, my question. Um, uh, it, given that you work for the TAP uh, project, is there any, any kind of technology which will make us safe for a specific development of, uh, you know, and the creation of a connected market between Western and Mediterranean area, Italy, and the Balkans? The Balkans have been pretty troublesome in the, in the past. They're still a little bit more troublesome than we can afford. So uh, what we, can we do with uh, an oil? the oil pipeline, I'm sorry, to uh, make sure stability will last a little bit more in the future. No, uh, uh, I take your point, Nicola. Um, uh, I tried to focus on the Balkans, especially in southeastern Europe during my presentation. I don't know if you were able to, to hear uh, um, loud and clear what I was saying, but uh, I think that Balkans are uh, uh, one of the key uh, areas where security of supply, I don't, I don't want to say is threatened, but uh, uh, for sure must be uh, uh, made safe, made safer. Uh, I would say that uh, the meaning of infrastructures uh, and like TAP is twofold. On one hand, as I was saying, uh, uh, we are providing uh, um, a new source to an area which, if we focus just on gas, is uh, relying on one source. And this is what uh, we were talking uh, about uh, earlier with, uh, with Mark uh, Ozawa, namely uh, the, the possibility for just one supplier to switch on and off uh, uh, um, uh, the supply uh, interrupter. The, on the other hand, we help decarbonize uh, these economies. Uh, they are heavily and significantly uh, reliant on uh, uh, very pollutant fuels like uh, uh, oil, but uh, even worse, coal and, uh, and lignite. I'm not talking just about the Balkans. I am talking about uh, Greece, for instance. Greece is reliant uh, for its uh, overall uh, energy consumption for more than one third on coal and lignite. And uh, Greece is part of the European Union. I can talk also about Albania. Albania did not even have uh, uh, the cadastre, did not even have a gas grid, a gas network uh, uh, in its territory. So this way, uh, big infrastructure, big project, it, it's not only about uh, a simple gas pipeline, but in overall, uh, I see this kind of, uh, of works uh, uh, can uh, support the growth and development of uh, entire countries, like for instance, happened in Albania. Uh, reducing distances, uh, um, uh, 
building bridges not only in a physical but also in a in, in a broader political way uh, that is uh, the ultimate uh, uh, reason of existence of um, companies like like, like that but not only of course um, i think that the oil and gas majors and infrastructure companies also have another key role to play in their future of geopolitics which is time trying to be uh, uh, to make markets more stable and to uh, foster connection between the different countries, as I was saying before. Um, when it comes to Nord Stream or, or other kind of disputes, I can agree with Mark when he said that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the attitude and the approach should be uh, not only one-sided, but two-sided from both parties. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to cooperation, when it comes to energy security, it's a matter, it's a global matter, not only uh, for one of the two parts involved. And this is my, my view on this. Thank you very well, this time. <laughs> so, uh, Marco, once again, uh, uh, I, I think that some kind of new deal must be cut among the big powers and the lesser powers, both in the Med area in Europe and in Europe, but not only in Europe, I mean, on a global level, maybe. Uh, is there any chance to get a new global agreement to carbon emissions and find new ways of, you know, de to develop the economy without making this planet dirty? You, you are touching a, a very strategic point, yes. uh, issue. I would say the, the, the most important uh, in terms of long-term view, long-term strategies. Uh, today, uh, the industry is sort of in a wait and see, standstill mode, uh, waiting for understanding what, what kind of regulation and at what level, what mm -hmm. dimension, regional, national or global, we will have on, uh, uh, on the um, carbon uh, um, uh, emissions uh, and so re related to possible carbon taxation, uh, uh, carbon border adjustments. Uh, the, the big question in my view is uh, also uh, touching uh, other uh, international security issues and strategic uh, issues uh, regarding the global competition is uh, uh, whether we will uh, manage to reach a global agreement uh, under the uh, COP26 or, or, or maybe later, but a global agreement on uh, carbon emissions. Uh, I, I, I would ask the, the, the organization to, to uh, uh, project uh, slide number four, please. Mm -hmm. uh, or if uh, this global agreement, uh, uh, which is really hard to reach, uh, will not be possible. And then in this case, it is uh, very likely that uh, regional competition among big players such as China, the European Union, the United States will, uh, will be triggered uh, with uh, a sub-optimal result, which is of course uh, better than nothing. I mean, the, the no option, the, the do nothing option is, uh, is not an, an option at all. We cannot uh, allow ourselves to, 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 to burn the pl planet, but uh, there is a, a big difference uh, between reaching an agreement that uh, will, uh, will uh, uh, not hamper a global, um, uh, the global economy, the global transaction, trans or uh, a different model, which is, uh, again, uh, very likely to happen, where uh, the big players will uh, sort of uh, raise different uh, rules, uh, one against each other, uh, competing also on the field of uh, carbon reduction. This is uh, something that will uh, shape the uh, uh, economic and energy competition in the future. Okay. The next question is for Mr. Ran. From those uh, I mean, who are following us, uh, I read it. Jordan and Israel are long-standing partners. Do you think that a solar energy water barter between the two countries is something feasible or desirable? May it have also wider repercussions on the area? Uh, solar energy is absolutely a new bridge between uh, Jordan and Israel, 
Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. And uh, we have to bring uh, Egypt into this picture because Egypt is adjacent to the Gaza Strip and will probably be very soon connected uh, with electricity and then eventually it will be solar electricity. So I think the four, Jordan, Egypt, Palestine and Israel create a very feasible uh, nucleus for energy cooperation. This is a serious advantage that Jordan has. It doesn't have any advantage in water. Uh, it lacks water. It doesn't have any advantage in energy, a uh, traditional energy, because it has no uh, natural resource for that, either gas, oil, or uh, something else. But I repeat, they have space and they have sun. And this is the basic equation between Israel and Jordan in the future. We will supply desalinated water. The Jordanians will supply the cheaper energy, the solar energy, because of their relative advantage uh, in this case. Thank you. Terozawa. One more question from our friends. The partnerships in the words of State Secretary Blinken have to be re revitalized. How do you think this should happen? I'm sorry, the partnerships with, uh, I didn't catch uh, Partnership in the words, no, in, in general meaning. Okay. Uh, the partnerships, if I understand the question correctly, partnerships mm -hmm. need to be revitalized? Yeah. Uh, how, how to go about doing that? Um, <clears throat> well, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, NATO has been fortunate to, uh, uh, to have interest from, uh, from <clears throat> countries in the region who want to uh, become partners with NATO. Uh, and in joining the partnership program, they receive, uh, th there's a, a variety of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, things that, that they can enjoy. Um, I think that the, and here I'm uh, learning a lot from my colleagues at, uh, at, at the NATO Defense College who focus on the partnership programs, but my impression from our discussions is that um, uh, sometimes there's an expectation from partners that uh, the, the relationship actually includes a lot more than, than what it does. Mm -hmm. um, there's a tendency to, to look to NATO uh, to solve uh, or address uh, problems that, uh, that NATO doesn't have a mandate to do. Um, but what I think NATO uh, can do is take this input seriously um, evaluate how it can respond uh, to the interests and concerns of its partners uh, and then act on that. And this is what NATO is going through right now with the 2030 process. It has taken in a lot of uh, input from the region, uh, from its partners, not just um, uh, in the near neighborhood, uh, but also uh, partners further afield. Uh, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, for 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 example, and uh, is responding to that, uh, will probably uh, come up with concrete ways that it will respond to that in the this summer, uh, if there is a new strategic concept. So, uh, going back to the original question, yeah, I think that uh, what NATO can do uh, to revitalize. Uh, the partnerships and to strengthen the partnerships is to listen uh, and uh, to the best of its abilities respond and if it's not able to respond to some of the concerns uh, then to be very transparent and explain why. Um, 
So uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Marco, uh, how do you see the role of gas in the future given collective decarbonization, sorry, decarbonization goals and your company's objectives? But, uh, we already uh, clarified even in the, in the last strategy uh, on February that uh, we have a very clear uh, uh, targets for the decarbonizing the company and our products. Uh, all our products in the, the so-called three tiers, not only our processes but uh, the, uh, the, the carbon that is inside the, 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 the whole stages up to the client use of the process. The process. And uh, the target is now to, uh, for a full decarbonization net zero mm -hmm. target by 2050. Uh, gas will uh, play a major role in this process, mm -hmm. which is, will be a, a, a decades long, of course, uh, uh, challenge. Um, we all know, and ENI has already clarified that uh, the oil will, be, uh, will have a key role, but uh, will start declining in terms of uh, uh, contribution uh, um, by uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, decade, while gas will still have a big role until the, 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 the end of the, of the cycle. And uh, in terms of uh, market per perspective, not only ENI, uh, most ana analysts uh, believe that the gas will still grow in, in the global, not, not uh, regional, not European contribution until the end of the, of the 30s. So we, will have, uh, we will rely on gas for another 20, 30 years. Long time, of course, in Europe, the, 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 the story will be a little different because we, the, the, the use of gas will decrease mm -hmm. uh, uh, gradually. Uh, replaced by renewables, but in other uh, areas where ENI is uh, increasingly involved, uh, especially uh, Asia, uh, Far East, uh, uh, China, Southeast Asia, uh, but also Africa, gas will be key for ensuring uh, that uh, I mean energy is uh, reduced, uh, energy poverty is uh, really reduced because, uh, as uh, somebody was saying, in uh, in the, in the first session of the, today, uh, of course we know that we need to decarbonize our economy, but there are other populations, other countries that want their own development and cannot just leapfrog to renewables in five years. So gas will be still a, a, key, uh, a key source, so we need to decarbonize the use of gas, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, a comment I would make, uh, and, and, and without taking much time, is that uh, there are uh, many uses of gas in the future uh, that is uh, implying a, a reduced or, uh, a, a, or really low uh, um, uh, environmental impact. For example, the blue hydrogen, which is uh, combining the production of hydrogen with uh, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, storage of the uh, CO2 in order not to, uh, um, to provoke uh, emissions. This is something that, uh, in our view, is one of the key solutions uh, for, for the future. But let me uh, uh, close with another um, comment. Sure. While talking about uh, uh, 2030, 2040, 2050, we need to decarbonize the use of the energy today. For example, linking our uh, products and our, our technologies to the use that uh, the defense sector makes of uh, fuels in, uh, in the aviation, for example. In the, uh, in the uh, production uh, of uh, generators, well, diesel uh, ad, uh, or, or jet fuels, where today, already today, we have uh, um, zero carbon products, we have uh, biofuels that are already available for the market. So you don't need to change the entire de technology to use those, uh, those fuels. Mm -hmm. And you get uh, an immediate advantage in terms of environmental impact, which is something that also the defense sector is already starting using, uh, for example, um, uh, these fuels for, uh, for the ships or, uh, or, for, or in the future, hopefully, for, for the jets. So, so is there something you want to add about it? I saw you taking notes. Yeah, yeah uh, well, 
I, I, Mark, who is, is, is very, is correct. And uh, this is one way that NATO uh, does very actively approach energy security is through uh, fuel efficiency, energy efficiency measures. Um, it's constantly uh, reevaluating uh, what it can do to lower uh, its carbon front footprint. And uh, as my colleague rightly pointed out, uh, uh, NATO is in fact, given uh, and the, the, the military operations, is a large uh, consumer of energy. And there's a lot to be done in the defense sector to, uh, 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 to, to become more efficient. Um, and in this respect, uh, I know that there is uh, uh, efforts and studies being put into uh, energy efficiency technologies, modernizing uh, uh, NATO bases, uh, uh, modernizing uh, the, the pipeline infrastructure that I, I mentioned that NATO uh, owns and manages that was built in the 1950s and 60s, uh, and a lot of people uh, uh, don't, uh, aren't aware that actually transporting oil and gas requires uh, significant energy to do that. So there are ways to, um, uh, to make NATO operations greener, uh, and this is definitely uh, part of the, the, the reflection process that has been taking place uh, over the last year, uh, and ever since uh, the creation of a division within NATO headquarters to focus on energy security, uh, th these questions uh, have been, um, are ongoing, uh, ongoing reviewed. But that, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, David, a uh, question for you. I, I read it. Uh, how is evolving the role of energy companies vis-a-vis -vis national and local governments in the new security supply of supply scenarios? So, to say that again? No, 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 it's fine. I Can you hear me? Can you hear me better? Okay. No, this is a key question for TAP, for instance, because uh, I guess you, you all are aware of the mounting criticism that TAP has uh, been facing over the years and that we were able to, to, to successfully tackle in order to complete uh, our infrastructure uh, um, within uh, the time frame set and especially um, matching the budget that we were uh, 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 allowed to spend. This is very important. I would say that on one hand, uh, uh, um, politicians have to be politicians, but on the other hand, uh, uh, also have to be pragmatic. Uh, and especially in the case of TAP, we saw that uh, uh, with all the governments that we had to face, uh, and TAP went through um, at least a three or four different governments. Uh, especially the last two ones were quite challenging, uh, as you as you may understand. But in the end, uh, all uh, uh, all colors of political uh, uh, parties um, understood that uh, at the end, uh, cooperation and collaboration for projects uh, uh, for sound project like ours uh, has to be has to be uh, accomplished. So uh, I would say that, uh, based on my experience, if uh, uh, an infrastructure, if a project is key for uh, uh, the stability of the area, for the security of supply of the country it crosses, and for the sake of growth of these countries, is more, more than welcome. Then, of course, it is also about the public acceptance of this uh, of this uh, infrastructure which is not easy uh, and the energy industry i think has to work a lot on making people aware of the benefits and the overall impacts that infrastructures uh, uh, ener let's say energy facilities uh, are taking onto the territory they are across because we are in a crucial moment where uh, uh, authority actually is not perceived as uh, 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 trustable uh, companies are perceived as uh, 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 entities which are far from the territories, which are imposing uh, uh, their will uh, uh, through uh, um, 
authorizations that are not uh, understood by the common people. So I think the energy industry at large has to uh, facilitate this dialogue, has to facilitate information, has to be transparent. And uh, only this way, and TAP is a proof of this, uh, uh, the, the, the fracture and the, the, the different positions can, and the polarization of this conflict can be can be softened uh, to the benefit, of course, of the of the end customers. Because at the end, we are talking about uh, the overall energy security. You can see what happened in Texas uh, uh, in this month, where a, a cold spell uh, uh, at the end uh, um, brought uh, severe severe and harsh difficulties uh, the whole uh, the whole system and. Uh, Energy is key, as most of, of people are, maybe are not aware of, but it's key for the development, it's key for the uh, survival itself of, of our society. And I think that based on my personal experience in the last four years, I've, I've been working for TAP at the end, uh, uh, despite uh, the criticism, despite uh, the fact that it's also a loss of consensus, uh, uh, giving the green light to sound projects uh, is key. To make uh, to make the energy system more stable and more and more diversified. Kyo, this is. Oh. Are you done? Yeah. No, no. I'm this is the very last question. This is for Mr. Rand. It's a very personal question. Um, don't you think that exporting democracy, not precisely the way President George W. Bush used to do? is the best way to create a friendly environment and stability in the Middle East. I mean, I'm referring even to the uh, opportunity of creating some way um, vaccine diplomacy between Israel and the neighboring countries. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, well, I remember the arguments when I was the ambassador to the EU and NATO between the various members of NATO concerning the Bush broader Middle East uh, initiative. And I was, my office was about uh, 10 kilometers from the NATO headquarters and I could hear the arguments between the American amb ambassador, uh, Nick Burns and the French the Beauville to the to in my without using uh, the phone uh, but uh, I would say that uh, I'm not so sure that this is the best way I think that if we have economic progress economic cooperation uh, the creation of a large middle class uh, by economic measures and incentives that in itself will bring a democracy more than an attempt to install something artificially on the societies in the region which are not yet uh, ready to accept a uh, Western quote unquote uh, ideas. So I think that I come back to the role of Europe uh, generally, but uh, more specifically the EU and NATO. Uh, the role of creating this regional cooperation, political, security and economic, and uh, by that we may get the results on creating liberal economy, liberal societies, faster than trying to impose it from the outside by all sorts of uh, sanctions or even incentives that not that they do not touch the core issues with which the societies in the region are uh, struggling and wrestling uh, so i would recommend the way of cooperation which has started maybe with the Barcelona process back in the mid 90s, the Mediterranean dialogue with, within NATO and the Mediterranean. These are, to my mind, much uh, more productive means 
of getting to the same goal. Thank you, thank you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I ended. Thank you. I say thank you to you with all my uh, heart. I say thank you to all the guests today of today's session. Uh, I think it's summer. For first, uh, I have to remind you that uh, the next session will be tomorrow at 3 o'clock p.m. So thank you, everybody here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.